All right, we're we just back bring ourselves back into um, the picture. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for thy sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all these things we are overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus." And so we get here, again, a picture or image of our eternal security. And Paul's, the, the concept here, of course, in our, uh, uh, is the third phase of our one salvation, which is glorification. And we're looking at God's perpetual love for every believer in Christ. And to underscore this certainty and security of our salvation and glorification, he raises this last question that we looked at last time. And now we're not going forward. That's what I was using. It's not, not doing anything. Let's see if that works. Okay, here we go. The question qualified, seven potential areas about which we might ask, if this is happening to me, does the Lord really love me? And so Paul is going to take each of these things, and, and when we look at each of these things, they're, they're two opposite ends of the spectrum, okay? And you'll notice how, how he compares these things, and it's one extreme to the other extreme. And of course, when, they, when Paul does this, he has in mind everything else in between. And so we, we know that, that he takes the, you know, the height or the depth. And so he's talking about whether you're at the highest height or even in the middle. You know, God has covered all of these things for us. And so we, we need to look at it from that perspective. And so the question qualified, does, does God really love me if these certain things happen to me? What if I have tribulation in my life, trouble, oppressive stress, or affliction? Does God really love me if these things occur? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4. Second Corinthians four verses eight through eleven. Paul speaking to us again, he says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who are for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. And so if we have tribulation, of course the answer to this is that it does not, um, the Lord still loves us, it doesn't separate us from the love of, of God. What if I'm under distresses? And we all have these things that enter our life, calamity, hard times, problems, or anguish. Well, does this separate us from the love of God? Look at 2 Corinthians, just flip over a couple of pages. Chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. And we looked at this verse um, earlier today. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted on every side, conflicts, within and, conflicts without and fears within. But God, who comforts the depressed, comforted us with the coming of Titus. And so Paul is, is telling us about the distresses, and certainly Paul was not separated from um, the love of Christ. And neither are we as believers, those who are um, justified and also will be glorified. What if you have persecutions in your life, suffering or hostility or being hated by other people? What if that arises in your life? Does that mean that God does not love you or God has, has um, forsaken you in those respects? Look at Acts 8.1. And certainly the answer is a rhetorical no to this question, but... Um, we have, um, in this scenario, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And, of course, this is referring to um, Stephen here being put to death. And we have persecution, um, Saul, before he became Paul. What if you're in famine, hunger, food, deprivation? What if you're in these situations? Does this mean God does not love you? Absolutely not. Look at Acts 11. Acts 11. 
verses 28 and 30, 330. And one of them named Agabus stood and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place during the reign of Claudius. In the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul and the elders. And so these believers were going to face a famine. Did that mean that God did not love them? That they, they had been separated from God's love? Well, absolutely not. What if you suffer nakedness, you're without clothes, you're being out in the cold, or you're homeless? What does that mean? Does that mean God doesn't love you as a believer? Well, absolutely not. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. This is the Hall of Faith passage. And God recounts many of the Hall of Faith. And here it's a little bit more generic. We don't get specific names. But we get the persecutions or the difficulties that these people endured. Hebrews 11, 37, and 38. It says they were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were tempted and they were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and ill-treated. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Did you catch that? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And so again, what if, um, again, these men are men in the hall of faith. They suffered these things that Paul is talking about here in Romans. And of course, the love of God had not um, been negated on their behalf. Verse 6, what if I'm under peril and danger or threatened? What about that situation? Has the love of God left me in this situation? 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 27. We looked at this passage earlier when looking at uh, what Paul knew about suffering itself. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 27. Are they servants of Christ to speak as if insane? I am more so, in far more labors and in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Fifty-five times I received from the Jews thirty-nine lashes. Three times beaten with rods, once with stone, three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen and from the Gentiles, from the cities, in the wilderness and on the sea. And among false brethren, I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger and in thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And so again, Paul faced many difficulties and peril, but certainly the love of God had not left Paul as it does not leave uh, other believers. What if I'm threatened by the sword? You know, many countries facing civil wars within, uh, violent death, backstabbing on those regards. Look at Acts 7. Verse 58, if we face wars and death and backstabbings, does this change the love of God for us? Has the love of God been negated on our behalf? Absolutely not, of course, is the answer to all of these questions. Acts seven fifty-eight. if I can get there. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses and laying aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he had called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And so here's Stephen, um, a believer, faced um, death, a violent death by stoning. And, of course, the love of God had not left Stephen. And, of course, he displays much humility as the Lord Jesus Christ did in forgiving them uh, as they acted. For, uh, number eight on here, can anything separate us from the love Christ has for us? And so Paul addresses each of these things um, uh, as, as looking at these polar opposites. Um, can anything do that? Can troubles or problems or sufferings or hunger or nakedness or violence um, or danger? Can any of these things separate us from the love that God has for us. Well, let's also look at, um, and of course the answer to all of that is absolutely not, no. Look at Psalm 44, 22. It will corroborate the potential difficulties for believers. And we'll see why Paul uses this verse in Romans chapter 8. So Psalm 44, 22. 
But for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And so we look at why does Paul cite this verse? And of course from the world's perspective, Christians are counted as sheep for slaughter. We are looked at as, as things to be gotten rid of, um, kind of like uh, the Islamic perspective of Jews. They're just something to be gotten rid of. They're to be tossed into the sea. And that's the world's perspective of Christianity. And of course, um, sometimes in, in America we have a, a, an attitude of popular Christianity. And of course, true Christianity has never been accepted um, in, a, in a great way. Um, so we also have to remember that um, the example here that, that's given in our text is Nero. Um, certainly Nero used um, the Christians as sheep for slaughter. The, the cover of your, of your book um, that Brett has on the, the Romans book, of course, shows the Colosseum and has the lion depicted in the front. And, of course, Nero persecuted the Christians by just tossing them in for the lions, for the, for the world, for the, the whole world at the time, and the Colosseums to sit around and watch, watch the Christians be eaten by lions. And you know, Nero was one to you know, just light Christians on fire for lights at his garden parties. And so, you know, just, just for the pure sake and fun of it, is how he persecuted. And, of course, um, you know, other Roman emperors, Domitian, at, at the time Paul writes this book of Romans, certainly he had, probably has Domitian and Nero in mind for these things and these persecutions that believers um, will endure. And so Christians um, are, have been considered by the world as sheep for the slaughter, and we will continue to be considered by the world as sheep for the slaughter. The fact that someone considers you a sheep to be slaughtered does not mean that God has abandoned you does not mean that God has abandoned you. But as we learned earlier um, today, that as, as part of our Christian life, we, are, uh, we can expect to suffer. Well, what does this mean, uh, mean for us? The answer to Paul's question in verse 35, of course, is a definite no. And all these things... Look at verse 36, we are overwhelmingly, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And so verse 36, just as it is written, we looked at this in Psalm 44. For thy sake we are being put to death all day long, we were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, that is those things above that he's just referred to, that is um, the tribulation, the distress, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the peril, and the sword, in all these things... We, as believers, overwhelmingly conquer through Him who loved us. And so, although we face these things, although we face these sufferings and these persecutions, we are overwhelmingly conquering. This is the certain conviction you have regarding verse 35, for you are convinced that nothing can separate us. Well, what about you? Through our study this week, have you been persuaded of this? And just recently, as we looked at the Romans um, 8, 28, and 29 passage, that he foreknew, he predestined, he, he called, he justified, he glorified. Because those promises that, that what God has done for us, has, has it convinced you that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He's the one that has done those things for us and on our behalf. And so we are to be persuaded of this truth in our own lives. No sphere of existence. And so now he goes through these spheres of existence that go from, um, from one end to the other, including death or life, can separate us from the love of God in Christ. You know, people ask the question about suicide. And of course, suicide does not separate us from the love of Christ. Certainly it is sin, and certainly it is not something that God would have us do, but it does not separate us. We still have the... Um, the righteousness of God. We were still justified and we will be glorified even though we made a bad decision. You know, of course, what if, you know, what if you're suspended? You know, what if you were on NASA's spaceship and the spaceship blew up, right? Okay, you're out of this world. God still has, has care for us. He's love for us. Nothing is, has taken us out of that sphere of existence. There's no supernatural power, including angels or principalities or powers that could separate us from the love of God in Christ. And certainly, um, this, the, this speaks of supernatural um, elements. The angels here, of course, the, the uh, elect angels, would certainly be on our behalf. And so he's not speaking here of the elect angels. He's speaking of the fallen angels. And the fallen angels being working against us. But they cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And also we have, you know, 
even if you think about this in terms of, of human, human government and human realms, and how human governments, and, and perhaps the way our own American government is headed for persecutions, but their powers will never separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so we can take comfort and encouragement in that. And the, um, you know, whether the Islamic countries, you know, we have uh, friends there and fellow believers there who perhaps fear the powers, you know, that are coming against them and want desperately to leave. Well, they should take comfort and encouragement in what God's Word tells us and teaches us um, in these aspects. They will not be separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Is Satan included in this? Of course, absolutely. He is a fallen angel. And so there's nothing Satan can do to separate us from the love of God. And so you don't have to worry about Satan accusing you or calling you or you know, keeping you from God's love or keeping you from being glorified. It is a fact. He cannot keep it from happening. Satan cannot separate us from the love of God. He may do his best to try, but he will fail. No present realities, no future possibilities, no things present nor things to come can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. No, nothing that happened last week can separate me from the love of God. Nothing that's going to happen Monday morning when I get back to the office is going to separate me from the love of God. It may be bad. It may be ugly. It may take a long time to figure out. It may be another one that fell through the cracks. But it will not separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so we can have whatever you're going through at present time, whatever the suffering is, whatever it may be, we can take um, calm assurance that it's not going to separate us from the love of God. It is a done deal in God's eyes um, that we will not be separated. What might this involve? Well, of course, you can do nothing, even in the future, to separate yourself from the love of God. Even if you decide to disown your faith, God is still faithful. So there's nothing that we can do. Again, this is something that God does for us on our behalf. So we certainly ask, what about our future sins? Is there some future sin that I might commit? Is there some horrible, terrible sin that the world views in, in that regard? Or maybe even it is a right to view it that way as a horrible, terrible sin. Is there something I can do that can separate me? Well, there's nothing that I can do. And that's what the Scripture teaches us. There's no horrible sin. And there's not even that, what if I you know, disown my faith? We were talking about that earlier, how... Um, there's a statistic that's going out that about 75% of, of Baptist young people that were active in their churches and youth groups abandoned and jettisoned the faith once they get in college. You know, after they became believers, and hopefully they were all believers, but that's what the statistic is about, that they were believers and they jettisoned the faith. Well, again, God still does not abandon, um, abandon us. What about our doubts? You know, our doubts that we wrestle with over our faith, maybe some great tribulation or suffering comes in our life and shakes us to our very core about what we believe and about whether God is good in this situation and whether God has been fair to us. And so we start having doubts and wrestling with our own faith. Or maybe it's you know, our carnality. That's our last blank there. Well, again, we're told that nothing, no things present or things to come, can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so again, it's a great comfort, it's a great encouragement to us knowing that God is the one who has it all under control. No extremes of location in the cosmos, no height, no depth, can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so whether it's the highest building or whether it's the lowest depths, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Well, can a believer drift away from God's love? Let's look at this passage. I think this is a, um, a great comforting passage um, that's comfort, comforted me many times in the past. Let's look at Psalm 139. This has verses 7 through 16. I actually want to pick up at, the, at number 1. Let's just start at number 1. Psalm 139.1, O oh Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thoughts from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down. 
and you are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you do know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before, and you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take to the wings of the dawn, if I, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, here are my doubts, and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. For thou didst form my inward parts and weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in thy book they were all written. And so a believer cannot ever drift away from God's love. There's no place, no darkness, no, no area that a believer can go that he's away and separated from God's love. He may be in a place of discipline. He may need to you know, certainly confess his sin, get back in fellowship. And maybe as, as Brett demonstrated earlier, he had you know, turned his back and gotten away from God. Certainly that's something that would need to be addressed, but we still haven't separated ourselves from the love of God. The next extreme that Paul does from the height through depth, the second one is neither the deepest valley or the highest height in the world can separate you from, the, from God in Christ Jesus. And so whether it's a trial or, or something else, nothing separates us. So neither the deepest valley nor the highest height in the world can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. When you are up or down, you cannot get far away from the love of God. Whether you're up or down, you cannot get away from the love of God. No created being or created thing can separate you from God's love. No created thing or being can separate you from God's love. Well, are you a created being? Certainly you are. So there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from God's love. No sin, no doubt, nothing can separate you from God's love. Not even you can remove yourself from God's love. You know, John 10, 28, you know, it talks about, you know, nothing can take you out of my hand. You're firmly in his grip. Nothing can take you out. And so some mistakenly say you can give back this free gift of salvation. But how do you give back your spiritual DNA and become unborn? You've been born again. And so you would have a new birth. And in this new birth, you have new DNA. What are you going to do? Unborn yourself? Well, you can't do it. It's an impossibility. And so, again, you cannot give it back. And so the triumphant conclusion is that no one and nothing, including you, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And hopefully now that you are persuaded, as the Apostle Paul, who penned it, that you are convinced of this thing, that you are persuaded by the promises that God has given, that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Can you make this declaration with all confidence? Well, we hope that you can after having gone through this study. Make this declaration with all confidence. And then finally, you will never be worthy of this, even on your best day. All the worth, all the praise, of course, goes to the Lord Jesus Christ and glorifying God the Father. And it's amazing grace that gives us this benefit. And so we have come to the end of the third phase of our um, salvation, which is glorification. I don't think we had that final one up there. Jubilation. 
We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Oops, sorry. The last one is jubilation. We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Romans 8, 37. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we'll, have, we'll close with prayer and I'll turn it back over to Brett. Heavenly Father, we, we again pause to thank you for the grace um, in which we stand. Um, that it's only by um, your grace that we, we have this so great of salvation that you've given to us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, that he rose again, and that our faith and trust in, in him and his work for us on our behalf gives us that so great salvation. And, and through that, you justify us, you have foreknown us, you've predestined us, you've called us, and, and eventually you will glorify us. And we praise you for that. And we praise you that nothing, absolutely nothing, um, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And in that, we base our eternal security. And it's in the name of the one who died for our sins and rose again that we pray. Amen.